Okay, let's pray. Father, we come to thy presence with the attitude of gratitude for all the blessings that you poured in our lives, O oh God. Thank you very much for keeping us safe and sound and bringing us again uh, to meet our brethren and to uh, learn about your word and uh, especially meditate on your word and uh, discuss and encourage our brethren. Lord, Lord, I pray this time we spend in your presence may be uh, beneficial to all of us, Lord. We, it may be mutually uh, edifying us and equipping us and uh, we want to hear your voice through your servant as he teaches, Lord. And we also pray that uh, uh, we may be able to have meaningful discussions and uh, uh, we may bless your holy name. All that we speak and do, Lord, may be acceptable in your sight. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. 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 Okay, well, we are, uh, like I said, uh, discussing spiritual disciplines. Last week, we discussed the discipline of prayer. And uh, this week, we are discussing solitude and silence. But before I actually make some comments uh, on that, uh, we should not forget that we are discussing this particular subject from the perspective of how does it help us, aid us in our spiritual growth. Uh, we must keep in mind that spiritual disciplines are, um, you know, they, they can be described as behaviors that facilitate spiritual growth. So that's where our focus is going to be. Just as a reminder, once again, um, they are not, you know, works uh, that saves us. Right? They are not laws that we obey, uh, which are mandatory for obedience. Uh, they are a means to an end, and the end is maturity, maturity in Christ. Uh, once again, to uh, quote Dallas Willard, it is, he says, it is not a sin to neglect them, but not wise to ignore them. So spiritual disciplines are uh, Christian um, behaviors that help us in our walk with Jesus Christ. Having said that, let me now discuss solitude and silence. And I must say that this is something I have not thought of. And I'm not sure how many of you have given this conscious thought, but uh, I have not done it. Uh, I have not studied this intentionally, uh, even though I may say that unintentionally I've experienced it, uh, but it is not something that I have given much thought to. In fact, when we, when, I mean, uh, there were times when I used to, you know, hear people talk about going for, you know, a time of solitude, go to a retreat where you remain silent for, you know, so many days. I, I used to even have something against it. I used to doubt it, you know, uh, because I was not sure exactly what do you gain by just remaining silent. Uh, it used to bring thoughts of or, or pictures of monasteries and monks, you know, and mysticism. Uh, and I felt that that seemed more like an escapist route rather than an active way of engaging with God. Um, so I had a difficulty identifying with this particular discipline called uh, solitude and silence. Uh, like I said, it seemed more mystical, maybe, uh, you know, this, uh, this, this thing about going inward or emptying the mind or becoming mindless. Uh, and, uh, and, and that way you're not really in touch with the real world. So, I felt that this kind of a discipline of isolating yourself and, and remaining in silence uh, were probably harmful. Uh, uh, and I did not connect it with a rational uh, belief system. You know, human beings are normally relational and social. We were created to be social and relational. Uh, and so I had, a, I had a difficulty trying to uh, identify with it. And now we hear about the pandemic and how people are in, you know, some sense of isolation. 
and actually causing depression to people. You know, people are getting depressed being in isolation. But I think as I was looking into it, and I, my study is once again, not very ex exhaustive and extensive, but the little I've understood of, I feel that maybe we, I didn't understand it correctly. Uh, and so let me, you know, launch into something that uh, I've never done before in terms of a particular subject. Talking about solitude and the silence that obviously you experience when you go through, you know, solitude, uh, give you a little bit of my experience. You know, uh, some of you might know that I lost my mother when I was seven years old. And so uh, when my dad, uh, you know, of course he brought us up, but then there were times when he used to travel. My brother and sister had already left home. And so I had plenty of time alone. And so I, I was forced into some sense of solitude, you could say. I, and I must say that uh, there were times I enjoyed it. The times I enjoyed a sense of peace and solitude in that respect. But there were also moments of loneliness. Um, I being a natural, uh, what do you say, introvert in my personality, I presume I could be comfortable with some sense of solitude. Um, but uh, I, as I am studying this, I see, I feel that there is a misunderstanding about the subject of solitude itself. Actually, it has nothing to do with your personality. It has nothing to do whether you're extrovert or introvert, but it is, it is an intentional discipline that anyone can engage in uh, like an exercise and derive certain benefits from it. Okay, so let me uh, make a few comments, read a few scriptures, and then I want your thoughts on it. And then I'll come back and like we did last time, uh, I want to first hear what you have to say and then share with you what I have learned through a little study I've done on it. Now, um, so when we talk about solitude and silence as a spiritual discipline, I think we are actually talking about a life of contemplation. It is actually a contemplative type of a discipline, which is not necessarily where you uh, empty your mind or do nothing, or you have no engage, you have no you know, intellectual engagement. And I think that is where I have understood, uh, or rather I have cleared my misunderstanding on it. Solitude and silence is not to be misunderstood with isolation or loneliness or avoiding people just because you don't like them, right? Uh, 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 you know, Jesus, and the reading through the scriptures seem to deliberately engage in some sense of solitude. Now, I, I don't know exactly what he did. Uh, we don't have all the details, but the scriptures indicate that he did uh, deliberately, uh, what do you say, enter into periods of solitude. All right. Let me read to you Luke 15 and verse 15. It says, the news about him spread all the more so that crowds of people came to hear him and to be healed of their sickness. But Jesus often withdrew to lonely places and prayed. So I don't, I, 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 uh, I'm not sure exactly what uh, that sense of withdrawing would actually mean, but there is obviously he had engaged himself in prayer. Uh, I'm not sure whether it was prayer in words, maybe there were periods where he used to use words, maybe there was silence or silent praying and an engaging with the Father and the Holy Spirit uh, because God can even read our minds. So, so Jesus definitely engaged in this experience of solitude. Let me read you another scripture in Luke chapter 4. This is something familiar to all of us, uh, how Jesus spent 40 days in the wilderness. It says, Jesus full of the Holy Spirit uh, left the Jordan and was led by the spirit into the wilderness where for 40 days he was tempted by the devil. 
he ate nothing during those days and at the end of them he was hungry right um, so jesus christ i mean um, seemed to be all by himself uh, he seemed to be able to withstand the onslaught of the devil so there was some sense of spiritual strength that he had or gained uh, he was also eating nothing. So he was also engaging in a spiritual discipline of fasting. So you can begin to see how these disciplines can uh, sort of merge. They can be, they can come together. So there is prayer, there is solitude, there is silence, there is fasting. Interesting, isn't it? So it seemed to point to some benefit being derived from this kind of discipline. Let me read you another one. In Matthew 14, it says, verse 13, when Jesus heard what had happened, he withdrew. This is when he had heard about John the Baptist being, uh, you know, uh, being killed. Uh, he withdrew by boat privately to a solitary place. I'm not sure if uh, he was maybe grieving for John the Baptist, but grieving is a, uh, uh, grieving in solitude is therapeutic. I'm not sure if that was what he was engaged in. Uh, um, so it seemed like Jesus did have times, periods in this earthly ministry of solitude. Along with this, there is a reference in the scriptures. If we go to Ecclesiastes 3, it talks about there is a time to be silent, right? There's a time to speak up, there's a time to be silent. Now, I may be taking that out of context. But uh, there seemed to be some indication of the value of silence, right? Uh, the, in Psalm 46, it talks about be still and know that I am God. What is this still? Uh, is, it, uh, it is, is it a type of a solitude? Is it a type of a waiting on the Lord in silence? Uh, could be. I'm not sure. My conclusion from a little bit of reading I've done is that I feel there is a mystery about this discipline called solitude and silence. I feel we cannot fully fathom it. Uh, I don't think we can fully understand the rationality and the dynamics of how it works in us, right? But the Bible talks about it. Jesus engages in it. Today, there is lots of people talking about solitude and silence. I'd like to share some more thoughts, but I want to break for the moment, uh, stop, pause for a moment, and ask you what are your thoughts, right? Have you, any of you practiced this particular discipline intentionally? Uh, do you, did you experience some kind of benefit if you have done so? How do you understand this discipline? So I'm going to stop there. And with the little comments I've made, why don't you connect them all together with your experience or understanding and share uh, your thoughts. Okay, over to you. Yes, Surya Murthy, go ahead. Uh, do uh, unmute yourself. I intentionally never saw, never sought solitude in a Regulated manner, but when your mind is buffeted by hundreds of problems, then the mind earns, earns to be alone for some time. Okay. And uh, when I am alone, by chance or by choice, I am not. A, I am never alone. There is always a feeling that. God is with you. The spirit is with you. Okay. So it is not a regulated thing, but as and when the mind wants to be alone. Right. To escape from the problems. Okay. Then it is solitude. Okay. Well, uh, yeah. Go ahead. Finish your thought. No, that's all. Okay. <laughs> It seemed to me that uh, you you uh, derive some sense of uh, 
uh, how shall I say, maybe a sense of peace. Relief. A sense of relief. And solitude actually helps there. Uh, is that what you're saying? Yes, sir. Yes. Okay, okay. That's interesting. Right. Okay. Who else would like to share the experience on this? Anil, is it you next? <laughs> Go ahead. Well, no, I, I, uh, I had a question actually. Uh, you know, when we are praying, we are uh, thinking of God, trying to concentrate on Him and talking to Him and so on. Isn't that a form of meditation? What is the base? What is the major difference between prayer and meditation? Yeah, okay. Yeah. Uh, I think, yeah, that's a good question. And that is where I feel, uh, even as I am, you know, studying these, all these aspects, uh, I'm beginning to see how they all dovetail with each other. And uh, maybe we are using terminology, uh, which, uh, you know, uh, actually, uh, how shall I say it? Uh, it's the same thing, but using different terminology. Uh, maybe with a focus on, you know, uh, or rather an emphasis on uh, maybe silence because you can silently pray also. Uh, so right. when you're praying, you're saying that we are, we are, well, you use the word meditate. So that is also a type of solitude. Is that right? Yes, yes. But, uh, you know, I, uh, I was talking to somebody and he mentioned something that uh, prayer is basically, you know, you're coming to God and asking him for something. I mean, you're of course praising him and so on. Primarily you're bringing your problems, your issues, and you're really saying, God, do please help me with this or help me with that and so on. Whereas uh, solitude and meditation and, and uh, all that is really a, a just a free form, free format conversation with God or, you know, I, I don't know if that makes sense, but uh, that's what he said. It's about, I think he was also speculating. Okay. Right. Yeah, I, I feel that, you know, various people have different experiences. Let's hear what Bertie has to say. Maybe he has an answer to your question. Bertie, go ahead. Yeah, we often hear, let's take a break, right? You must have heard of this thing. Uh, let's take a break. Break from what? Break from what Surimuthi says, you know, <laughs> being buffeted and, you know, all sorts of thoughts and other things. Even in prayer, uh, I think uh, Anil will agree that even when we are praying, all the others will agree, we are distracted. I personally am distracted when I'm praying or, you know, I can't get and I just get lost in other things. And what I'm trying to say is if you can separate yourself geographically, like take a holiday in Goa or maybe in Kowalam, you know, let's go for a little holiday, you know, where you're separated from the normal thing. And you could call it a, a time, a time away from the crowds, like the Lord, Jesus himself said, he, uh, you know, he withdrew and went to uh, went to places uh, where he conversed with the Father and the Holy Spirit. I think we can do the same if we. Uh, and this is a very good discipline. Uh, but my point is, uh, get away from uh, you know where you are, uh, your normal living, and go to uh, may, maybe just go for a little you know holiday somewhere where you know you are relaxed. Uh, they say like uh, going to Goa, you feel a life of you know set uh, laid back living and uh, you know quietness and you know the peace that you receive. It may not. I'm just for example. I'm saying there are other places as well. But break, uh, take a break, a withdraw from your normal thing and go take a holiday somewhere and okay. intentionally, intentionally try to uh, you know be in a state of uh, prayer with God or solitude or be quiet. And uh, you're not emptying your mind, but uh, you are intentionally wanting to contact and say, Lord, cleanse me. Uh, Lord, just empty my mind. Lord, help me to get right with you. Right. Okay. It uh, Two things come to my mind <laughs> as I heard you. One is for you, solitude is a holiday. <laughs> <laughs> but, uh, but in addition to that, uh, solitude also seems to be, it's not necessarily solitude, but presence. Uh, being in the presence of God, I think even that Surya Murthy seemed to be uh, alluding to that, right? Okay, so it is not doing nothing, but it's a diff. It's it's like a like you like you rightly said a break. Okay, let me have if anybody else have any thoughts on this. Uh, okay, Vanessa, go ahead, and and Praveen after that. Yeah. 
okay it's uh, that uh, i i have i have been on uh, meditation camps on retreats and uh, i i what i see and what i feel is uh, solitude is more beneficial for me and uh, sometimes i feel guilty because i want to be alone because i feel that when i'm with family or i have family members around then i'm not able to pray free i'm not be able to show my emotions when i'm praying if if uh, like there's usually somebody interrupting or coming in between so so you're not able to give your all full attention of what you want to give when you're praying to god so i i feel that solitude i something wrong for it and i love to be alone i want to be alone with no family no one i just want to live alone so i'm free to pray and free to do how i wish so, so i don't know whether i should feel guilty for it or not or <laughs> like i being away from family i want to live alone so okay. so that my my closeness to god is felt more and i am able to relate more so is it is it a sin or is it something bad that i need want well uh yeah. i think uh, uh to maybe we can talk about the, you know the, the sinful sinfulness a little later but with what you said uh you enjoy pri privacy right and uh, you seem to i mean especially with your catholic background i'm sure you have ex experience those sense of retreats and all of that and you seem to enjoy being by yourself uh, which which is wonderful you know i mean uh, but anyway i mean uh, i don't want to say more than that we'll we'll probably see how it goes and we'll we'll, we'll bring back a few thoughts i think praveen has something to add here go ahead praveen yeah couple of thoughts primarily i would like to address what um, uh, anil brought it up like meditation prayer all these things sounds uh, all these things in experience uh, uh, maybe we feel almost uh, similar but there are very few uh, differences which may help us uh, to understand these things properly i personally feel that way prayer is more like uh, we all know that we talking to god we open our minds and hearts and we explore uh we spread it in in god's presence and the solitude is something where we open our minds and ask god to uh, spread his thoughts in front of us so that we may be able to uh, realize it and the third thing is meditation meditation is something we, we it is not something like we just keep our minds open we are meditating on the word of god so when we ask about when we talk about prayer we will be talking out our heart when we talk about solitude will we we would like to hear the heart of god and uh, number 3 is when we pray uh, so when we meditate we meditate on the word of god which has been already re revealed and we'll be having a thread through which we'll try to uh, reach or we try we try to find out what god has uh, stored for us that's where the meditation takes place and one more thing that we need to understand when we talk about solitude is solitude is not just going away from people uh, to an extent uh, what mr suryamurthy said like you know we have so many thoughts we just need a break for some time uh, to an extent it is right but at the same time the christian solitude is not that also christian solitude is casting away all the thoughts and burdens that we have and coming close to christ as jesus called uh come to me all who labor and have heavy laden i give you rest if we could not come with this perspective towards christ our solitude is not uh going alone go, go, trying to be alone our solitude is more like to be with christ alone it is not being alone it is to be with christ alone that is christian uh solitude so Uh, where we it is a more relational aspect we open our hearts and minds and if we remove the christ thing from this uh, when we talk about solitude and uh, we go into all sorts of uh, what we call mere uh, mysticism and all these things which uh, that is which is not christian okay yes uh, i like that point about relational solitude can still be relational and i think that's very very uh, 
uh, I think that's very helpful. Yes, Bertie, go ahead. Uh, yes, relational with the Lord. That's primarily as uh, I can, if I can just touch upon what uh, Praveen mentioned, the last point, it's uh, we, uh, we make a deliberate thing and we, we are conscious that uh, that when we are uh, when we take uh, when we are in solitude or when we go to a pay, uh, a place where we uh, you know we find quietness, it's actually not uh, you know uh, nothing uh, or just uh, empty minds or you know trying to you know uh, reach out to God. We are consciously going. Uh, we need to know that we're consciously resting in the Lord, as God has promised. Come to me. What He means is, you come and rest with me. I will you know help you and unburden you or and uh, love and bless you. You know, we are, we are consciously having a, rela a relation with the Lord, but uh, knowing that in the Lord, I get the true rest. Okay. Yeah. Yes. Thank you, buddy. Yes. Uh, uh, any other, any other, any others would like to share any thoughts? Otherwise, uh, let me just share with you what, what I was able to uh, study and then we can come back and do a little bit more of uh, you know, sharing with each other. All right. So let me go ahead and uh, bring you what I have understood from a little bit of study I've done. Uh, it's more from an amateur or a theoretical position because I'm no expert in solitude and silence. Um, but let me begin by saying that uh, when we look at life today uh, and, the, and the way life is being lived by most people, especially, you know, the younger generation. I think we can definitely identify there is something wrong in the way life is being lived. And uh, uh, let me explain that a little bit more. And I'm sure you will agree that uh, there is this, uh, there is something out of whack today in the way we live lives, you know. And uh, it seemed to be so heavily dependent and focused upon activity, right? Being busy. Uh, we are so performance oriented uh, to such an extent where we want, you know, uh, constant stimulation to do the next thing, right? Uh, we, we are so used to noise around us, right? Uh, and, uh, to such an extent where some people don't are not able to even sleep without the noise, <laughs> right? I mean, all the uh, all the you know Mumbaiites uh, enjoy their noise. I don't think they can sleep in uh, Sainipuri here in Hyderabad because it's too quiet. <laughs> so we tend to get so used to noise and activity, and to some extent there is an addiction to to all of this and to be in, you know, to be in a hurry. Everybody is hurrying. If you look at the morning traffic, you can see people be, you know, constantly in a hurry. And that's where we also get the concept of fast foods. You know, everything should be done in a, you know, in a jiffy. Uh, and, you know, did you hear about the Indian version of fast food? It's curry in a hurry. Right? I don't know if you heard about that, but we also have our fast foods, curry in a hurry. What about the concept of 24-7? We talk about 24-7, and there is a TV channel by, by, you know, by that. 24-7, that seemed to be uh, the kind of uh, you know, uh, lifestyle we have not just adopted, but become addicted to. We want to get more done in less time so that we have more time to get you know, more done. So that seemed to be the focus today of, of, of uh, uh, the lifestyle that we've adopted. Uh, uh, a senior pastor, his name is John Ortberg, he writes, he says the following, hurry is not just a disordered schedule, but hurry is a disordered heart. <laughs> Interesting thought, you know, I mean, uh, this addiction to hurry and activity and constant 24-7, you know, stimulation to do things, to be involved in things, um, can indicate perhaps a disordered heart. That's what he seemed to say. There are people who boast about, uh, you know, being, being working 18 hours a day, right? Uh, as though it's a virtue to be working that much, you know? 
Um, but I think psychologists are beginning to understand that just pure activity gives rise to a growing sense of dissatisfaction. There is a great deal of dissatisfaction in amongst a lot of people and young people are, uh, we, we see that in the young people also. Uh, there is a diminishing return to all that we invested uh, and that can lead to a downward spiral for some people being involved in so much of this kind of activity. And I suppose in a situation like this, silence and solitude, as somebody said, would be like a safety net, you know, below the tightrope. It almost seems like we are walking this tightrope. But silence and solitude can be like a safety net, just to unwind, just to move away from, like some of you said, uh, from the onslaught of, you know, thought and noise and activity and all of those things. Now, even as I men uh, uh, even as I mentioned that. I also want to mention on the other hand, that we don't have to glorify laziness on the, you know, and I think the Bible is very clear about that. Uh, a constant life of leisure uh, or idleness is obviously not going to, you know, help uh, uh, necessarily. Uh, because as somebody said, empty minds can become a, the devil's workshop, right? And of course, and many of you or all of you know that the Apostle Paul warns against idleness. Uh, he talks about even goes to the extent of saying those who are just remain totally idle should not even eat. So, uh, so it seemed to indicate to me that we have to find the balance. Uh, it's not wrong to be busy and wrong, not wrong to be engaged in very, you know, work and activity. But there is also has to be a pullback. Like Bertie said, there has to be a break. You know, we Christians talk about quiet time, right? There has to be also a quiet time rather than just the constant hurry that we face. So there has to be some kind of a, uh, you know, uh, a, a via media between the two. So that's one thought I'd like to share with you. Uh, let me just then quickly go and uh, talk about benefits of this solitude and silence. But before that, just to define as much as I can understand, what is solitude? Uh, it, is the it is the practice of temporarily being absent from other people and other things so that you can be present with God. And I think many of you echo the same uh, sentiment. Uh, it's, a, it's a negative in the sense that you withdraw from people, but it's also positive you draw closer to God right? It's not loneliness, uh, nor is it getting away from people just because we don't like them. And maybe Vanessa can <laughs> relate to this. It's not just that you don't like other people and you want to be by yourself, but it is a, a, a deliberate attempt to be closer to God. Uh, it is certainly not empty-mindedness. As uh, Richard Foster, one of these fellows who writes about this, he says, it's more a state of mind and heart than a place. So solitude is not just empty place, you know, a, a place emptied of people. Silence is not necessarily emptied of mind, but it's a state of mind and heart. And I'm presuming it's a spiritual state of uh, mind and heart where we are in touch with a higher reality, a greater reality, and we know that is God. It is probably as I think even Praveen said, resting in God, right? It, a solitude and silence is a way, a manner, a, a way of resting in God, not an emptiness and void. In the same way, when we talk about silence, it's not so much the absence of sounds and noise, noise, but more to listen to the voice of God. You know, when I say voice of God, it's a metaphor. Uh, we are not having an audible voice, but it's 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 a connection, a spiritual connection with God. Richard Peace, another uh, uh, pastor says, the spiritual disciplines keep us alert to the presence of God. So silence is not where you are completely absent of noise and uh, you know, any, any other thing, but it's you are very aware of the presence of God. 
you know, talking about my own experience, uh, you know, listening to the, you know, I, I enjoy, uh, Bertie mentioned Goa and I've been there several times and I've always enjoyed walking by the beach, especially early mornings when you don't have the crowds and you walk on the beach and you have the crashing of the waves. There is something therapeutic about that. The chirping of birds in my backyard, by the way, uh, I invite you all to come to my backyard for a cup of coffee and hearing the chirping of birds. But that is very, uh, you know, soothing, refreshing, juven rejuvenating, right? So silence is not, it's not just talk, uh, not talking, but it is listening. Silence is, is listening, right? Uh, and most of you would have heard this, silence can sometimes be more powerful than words. Okay, having said that now quickly, how does this silence and solitude that we talk about benefit us spiritually? And that, like I said, is the focus. And I had just three quick points to make. One is, I'm putting it this way, it breaks the power of hurry. Right? It breaks the power of hurry. Our addiction to have to do this mentality, right? Uh, nothing can wait. It has to be done now. The now syndrome. So it breaks that power of being a slave to hurry and activity and helps you to withdraw a bit, right? It breaks the addiction to round the clock performance. Now, let me uh, quickly bring in a disclaimer. Otherwise, I will, I, I, you know, my daughter won't be very happy. It's not wrong to work around the clock. In fact, my daughter just returned from a 48 hour duty. Can you imagine that? Uh, because of someone not being available in the emergency room. Uh, she had to do a 48 hour shift. Uh, so, but, but she's get two, day, two days off. So that is, that is wonderful. So, but when you get addicted to that kind of a thing and you just can't break away from it, I think that's a problem. Solitude helps to break that addiction. It helps you slow down. There is a need for that, uh, for, for that slowing down regular. The body requires cessation of work and work and hurry and hurry. It needs a cessation from that. And God ordained sleep as part of our existence, <laughs> precisely because he wants us to move away from just work, work, hurry, hurry, work, work, you know. Uh, and sleep helps us to break that monotony. In this regard, I must mention the Sabbath, as we have understood it, becomes very meaningful when you just withdraw from your regular activity. The Sabbath becomes a place where you can take that time of solitude and silence and enjoy the presence of God. And so in that respect, the Sabbath can be very, very meaningful. In the book of Isaiah, chapter 30, verse 15, it says, For thus, for thus the, Lord, the Lord God, the Holy One of Israel, has said, In repentance and rest you shall be saved. In quietness and trust is your strength. That verse reminds me or it tells me that, that resting in God, which is solitude, and quietness, that is silence in God, is our strength and salvation. So God is helping us to recognize that uh, there is a need for us to come to him deliberately, intentionally, take some time, with a sense of solitude and silence and engage with him, listen to him, uh, you know, be rejuvenated with him. So that is one benefit I feel uh, silence and solitude can bring to us. A second point I'd like to mention is it creates an inner space to hear the voice of God. Now we have mentioned this, but I deliberately take it as a second point. It creates an inner space to hear the voice of God. And here I bring the example of Elijah. Most of you know the story of how he challenged the prophets of Baal. And he was feeling like a big hero. But all of a sudden, he had to run away because his, you know, Jezebel was after his life. 
And then as he rested in the cave, in solitude and silence, if I can add that, he could hear the still small voice, the still small voice of God. Interesting, isn't it? Uh, here was Elijah, you know, uh, engaging in the spectacular display of power, right? The spectacular activity, the dazzling display of, you know, God's power. And he must have thought, well, you know, that is the presence of God. But God, you know, uh, put him in a situation where he had to sleep. And God had to wake him up to eat so that he would have some energy. And he had to sleep. Uh, and then he heard the small, still voice of God. Maybe this is helping us to understand that sometimes we hear the voice of God in this solitude and silence. We may not be able to hear it in all of this activity and, you know, uh, all of this running around and, uh, you know, programs and doing this and doing that. No, sometimes you might hear God a little bit more clearly in a, a sense of silence and solitude. Because maybe God is helping us understand he's not limited. He can be accessed even in a sense of weakness like Elijah and silence and solitude. He does not, he does not need to be giving dazzling display of power and healings. But sometimes in our sickness, in our weakness, we can probably hear God in a much more, in a more clar clarifying way. All right. So it's maybe it is telling us that it is necessary for us to enter that space of solitude and silence, as we understand it, to recognize God uh, in all his multifaceted presence. His presence is not just in the dazzling and the, and the big and the spectacular, but also in sometimes in the most weakened situation, as the Apostle Paul recognized that he experienced the grace of God in his adversity, right? In that situation, it could be promoting or it could make you more sensitive to the prompting of thoughts of the Holy Spirit. And I think I can vouch for that. There are times, you know, when I want to understand something, I think a sense of solitude. When I sit in my study, I like to watch, look out of the window and look at the greener. There is a sense of, you know, uh, 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 what uh, I can say it as a greater sense of connection with God and uh, perhaps thoughts flow a little bit more freely. One more thought I'd like to leave you with and that is solitude and silence helps us face the self without distraction. Yeah? Facing yourself, coming to know yourself probably is better facilitated in a sense of solitude and silence, right? In other words, it helps in rigorous self-examination, right? And sometimes we don't like to do that. And so we try to run away from solitude and silence because it, in a sense of solitude and silence, maybe we understand ourselves better because it can help reveal our motivations, our values, our compulsions, uh, our disappointments, it can help us face the, some of these things with a greater sense of clarity. It helps us confront our true selves, our real selves, right? As one uh, author, one philosopher says, it helps us experience the experience, right? You have an experience, but sometimes when you uh, reflect on the experience. You, you learn to experience the experience. You, you learn to enjoy the experience and learn from it. And in this respect, many of you know the uh, interesting uh, parable of the prodigal son. And I just want to focus on one aspect of it. That is one of the probably the more rich you know, parables that Jesus Christ brought, uh, especially to help us understand the heart of God. But, but let me just go back to the, 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 the younger son who left the house. And I just want to read you a passage from Luke 15 uh, and just help us re uh, reflect on the experience of 
this son. And let me read from verse 13 onwards. It says, not long after that, the younger son got together all he had. You remember this was after he had asked for his inheritance and he took it away and he went. He set off for a distant country and there squandered his wealth and wild living. After he had spent everything, there was a severe famine in that whole country and he began to be in need. So he went and hired himself out to a citizen of that country who sent him to his field to feed pigs. He longed to fill his stomach with the pods that the pigs were eating, but no one gave him anything. When he came to his senses, and that's something that perhaps is good for us to reflect on. When he came to his senses, he said, how many of my father's hired servants have food to spare? Right? And here I am starving to death. I will set out and go back to my father and say to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and against you. I am no longer worthy to be called your son and make me like, make me like one of your hired servants. And so he got up and went to his father. I'll stop there. I'm just taking a portion of that. But, you know, it just uh, brings some very some very powerful you know reflective thoughts there did he come to himself in a moment of solitude and silence as long as he had money he had activity he was doing this and that and feeding the pigs and everything but maybe he took a, a moment off and went into a sense of silence and sol solitude did that give him a clear head did the self-talk, notice there is a self-talk there. He's talking to himself. Maybe that is a sense of silence. He is, his heart is speaking, right, to himself. Uh, did it bring a greater sense of clarity and help him make the decision to make? So the, the point I'm trying to make is solitude and silence can help you face your real self. Right? Maybe it will aid in that. It will facilitate helping us to see ourselves a little bit more clearly. If we are honest with ourselves, if we are not honest with ourselves, we remain narcissistic. Right? We'll only praise ourselves. But here this man comes to himself and did solitude and silence help him? I believe it did. Right? So I'm going to leave you with that. Now you may ask me, well, you know, how do you practice silence and solitude? I don't think I'll go into that. All I'll say is it's different for different people, you know, different timings. Uh, sometimes, you know, you, you can walk in the park and with nobody around and you can feel a sense of, you know, uh, connection with God in that, in that solitude. I mentioned to you about the beach. Maybe uh, the beach could help. Some people I know go to the terrace, uh, you know, the terrace on our, the roof of our houses uh, because you get a sense of peace. But if you go to the terrace, I may just, just warn you, be careful that you don't spot Bathsheba anywhere. <laughs> okay. Uh, some people like the early morning walk or the late night walk. But the key is to be alone. Dwell on God. Dwell on scripture. A prayer in silence. On many occasions, there is a silent prayer that you offer to God. Uh, so spiritual and these spiritual disciplines are all interconnected. Like you see, there is prayer going on. There is meditation going on. There is maybe a sense of, you know, silence. And uh, uh, you could be doing two, three things or even fasting along with that. So, so let me leave it there. Just wanted to share those thoughts with you. We've got a, maybe a good 10 minutes. So please uh, feel free to bring in any of your thoughts or comments you'd like to make. Right. Did any of those? Yes, uh, Suri Moti, go ahead. Make sure you unmute yourself. Unfortunately, for most of the people around the in the or people in the world, that is outside the church. When they are alone. And when they want to self-talk, 
they reach out for the mobile phone <laughs> that is very uh, i feel serious. sorry about that okay <laughs> you know uh, these days people talk about a tech fast have you heard of a tech fast <laughs> yeah. fasting without any gadgets uh away from the internet <laughs> away from the internet yeah yes uh, this is such a habit that people have reaching out for the phone you know uh, people i mean you you see that so often in the restaurants when two people are sitting and eating they are busy with their phones rather than conversing yeah but yes that's a, that's unfortunate that's a distraction that's a complete and that's an enemy to solitude and silence okay is there any practice that you have done or feel can be helpful feel free to share with us uh, any any specific practice of this particular kind this discipline of solitude silence Yes, Anil, go ahead. Rekha, go ahead. No, I we were just talking that, you know, the most difficult part of this uh, uh, meditation and solitude and all that is the trying to focus your thoughts on the subject that you're thinking about because your mind goes all over the place. <clears throat> so, you know, uh, we're, we're thinking of God, but then suddenly you think of a problem and your thoughts go in that direction and so on. So I think, uh, as you said, you're not going to talk about how to meditate and how to, uh, you know, solitude and all that. But I think that would help if uh, at a later date or something you can tell us how. If we find some time every day, at any particular time where you can just be alone and with God, that does help and make it more and more every time. The intimacy with God is the most important thing. So if you make it of its nature every day, a little time, five minutes, ten minutes accordingly, and then in, 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 increase it every day. That would help. Yes, I think, like I said, it's different for different people. Uh, you know, I, I, I don't know, but uh, some people uh, actually like solitude with some with some, uh, you know, music in the background, yes. soothing music. Now that is not silence by itself, but maybe you are quiet in your soul, uh, deep inside yourself, even as this, and that helps from distraction, apparently. I don't know, some people find it that, you know, that it may help from distraction. So these are different ways you can do it. But the main thing is like you rightly said, uh, do you feel a sense of closeness to God? Do you feel, let's say, a presence of God? I think that is the that is the key thing. That's very important. Mm -hmm. right. I think Mrs. Noah, with your with your, with your rich experience of ninety plus years, would you have any any uh, thoughts for us in terms of solitude and silence? <laughs> uh, can can someone un unmute you because we can't hear you uh, if there is someone on the side there just ask them to unmute so we can hear you no i don't think i can looks like uh, mrs noah is in solitude <laughs> <laughs> sorry mrs noah we can't hear you i wish we could <clears throat> unmute it unmute right I think we can do it. No. Oh, good. Somebody is there. Right. Ah, here we go. Yes, Mrs. Noah, please share your thoughts with us. Yeah, I had so many times I was alone. <laughs> right. I know about solitude. More of my life is like I'm the only child. Nobody to walk, nobody to talk, and I was alone. And even after marriage, also, 
I went through all those experiences. Right. Okay. So looks like you are on forced, forced solitude. <laughs> yeah, that. Right. Mr. Rao, I think you had a thought. <laughs> Uh, can, can you hear me? Yeah. Can you hear me? Yes. Yes. <clears throat> yeah. Actually, when we are alone, sir, uh, especially while praying, you are very free to talk to God. I mean, see, when you are with somebody, sometimes you may not get the ideas to pray. But when you are alone, you can take time and you can pray. Yeah. Uh, and you are normally close to the God at that, at that time. And when you are meditating, sometimes you get some thoughts which are spiritual and we can enjoy that. Okay. Certainly, yes. Uh, you know, uh, you are more free to talk to God when you're by yourself. So solitude helps your prayer life in that respect. Yeah. Right. Uh, and of course, it, it, it stops from any distraction. Any final thoughts as we wind down? Yes, Vanessa, go ahead. Okay, this, this solitude that you talk about, and as uh, Palvin mentioned, it is it is uh, in different forms. It is when we give our heart and we talk to God, and when God speaks to us, and uh, how we uh, the interaction, the different parts of interaction with God. But uh, even in solitude, even uh, we are not hearing what God wants to tell us. Maximum of the time, we are just uh, talking to God, and we are we are either asking him or thanking him or telling him, but, but he, we don't hear what he wants to tell us. So when we cannot hear what he wants to tell us, are our thoughts, are, is he conveying his message through our thoughts, the thoughts that we have, supposing we uh, introspect ourselves, and we, say, we say, we think, we think that, okay, we have done this wrong and we need to, um, work on ourselves and we need to better ourselves in this way. So is that a way of him telling us? I'll let Praveen answer that since uh, uh, he is the one who brought it up. Go ahead, Praveen. Um, yeah, that is a very genuine question. I really appreciate that. We all go through that. We all go through the confusion. Uh, some people go through the confusion to understand whether it's a voice of God or it's uh, others' voice, other um, our own voice or any other voice, and for many they take it for granted, and they think every thought that come in their mind it's from God. God gave it, and they do all sorts of uh, things that mess their lives up, and uh, unfortunately they they share some thoughts about others, which mess others' lives also. So all these things are happening very much. And uh, but one thing I would like to, uh, to tell you, Vanessa. Number one is this one. Uh, we all have the fear whether we can hear the voice of God or not. We don't. We are not very much confident about it. And John chapter ten it says that my sheep hears my voice. Since you are the sheep of God, you are given the ability to hear His voice. And then. And uh, we are given the opportunity to hear. Jesus says a word saying, He who has ears to hear, let him hear. You heard the word? That is really crazy. All the people who are standing in his presence, do you really think that they don't have ears? All of them have ears. And to hear, the, all of them have ears, but many of them, uh, some of them may be not having the ability to hear. They may be deaf. Jesus healed some. So it is talking about the ability to hear. So people who are ch children of God and ch sheep of God, uh, it is talking about people who have the ears, which is opportunity to talking about uh, opportunity to hear, and it is talking about, uh, about ability to hear. And last thing is let them hear. It is Jesus is calling us to hear Him. So we are given the opportunity, ability to hear, 
and he is speaking to us how does he speak sometimes it may not be literal uh, uh, physical uh, voice of god audible voice of god uh, it can be through a thought and your question is clear it is where you said uh, oh, how do i know it is a thought of god or my personal thought okay but before that i would like to ask you to be assured about this that it is uh, as apostle paul says in philippians chapter 1 verse 6 it is god who works in you both to will and accomplish so god works to uh, in our lives through the thoughts so god plans his thoughts in our minds and our uh, psalmist says you know the thoughts be even before they are formed in my head god knows all those thoughts and he is able to communicate to us by imparting some thoughts in our minds and finding out how do i know whether it is my thought or whether whether it is god's thought and it is very crucial thing and uh, i'm telling you even uh, i'm also going through my journey all of us are going through their own journeys but one thing i can tell for sure god's thoughts are always other centered if you got a thought where it is where it inspires you to help others and to be good to others and which which and helps you to be other centered and definitely you can consider it is god's thought because that is the very nature of our god our god is an other centered god and when god gives his thoughts it enables the relationships and if those thoughts we can very strongly you can take if a thought is other centered if a thought is relational if a thought that is related to service love and all you can definitely take it is from god and you can move forward and uh, if any other thoughts i'm not able to judge all but this is one stream where you can very strongly and confidently hold on and move forward so this i can <laughs> tell as of now okay does it make yes thank you praveen i think uh, that's helpful and i can just add to that one thought and that is uh, you know you if you are if you are confused about you know god's speaking to you uh on thought one thing we have to keep in mind what communicate you whatever god communicate to you can contradict his own scripture his own word right it does contradict scripture so if there is anything like people say god spoke to me but i check whether it is god by checking to see you know if it is in alignment with the written word of god if it is anything is against that then obviously i have to put a big question mark so i'll just leave you with that All right I think uh, we've done well for uh, today we've gone slightly over time thank you very much again for sharing your thoughts uh, we will take a few more wednesdays to do spiritual disciplines we'll talk a few more about uh, uh, a few more disciplines and hopefully this will be helpful for us again thank you for joining us and uh, let me request uh, uh, anil if you can lead us in a in a closing prayer thank you Uh, anil sir you are on mute yeah that okay god almighty we come before you lord thanking you for this opportunity to fellowship and to hear your word father and to learn from it god almighty god we know that meditation and prayer is a vast subject and lord with your help we can be a little more clear about it lord so continue to teach us feed us our spiritual food father and help us lord to think on your word to really uh, go deep into your word and try and really understand what you're trying to tell us god oh father we know you are with us in this journey please continue to guide us in our everyday life help us lord as we go out to be a light into the world father and god we just pray help us to be your faithful servants help us to stay on the straight and narrow path always lord and help us to be of help to others thank you lord dismiss us now lord in your presence we pray and ask all this in jesus holy name amen
Amen. Thank you again. God bless you. Have a good rest of the day.